One of the most interesting aspects of the electric vehicle industry is the amount of innovation that's taking place in the battery space. The yeah, number of uh, innovative or the number of, you know, very creative engineers that are being thrown at the at this industry and the amount of capital that's going into funding science and engineering is really quite astonishing. And I think out of that, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're seeing so uh, such a rapid change in the energy density of batteries and in addressing some of the issues around lithium ion batteries. So I'm gonna to talk to Dr. James Frith, who is a principal with Volta Energy Technologies and former head of energy storage analysis for Bloomberg NEF about battery innovation. So welcome to the interview, James. Hi, Malcolm, great to be here again. Well, look, um, there are, maybe we start off this conversation with a kind of an overview of innovation within the, the battery industry. You're, you've been at this for a long time. Is your impression that innovation is speeding up? Uh, uh, where are we at with that? So this is a, a, a great question. And I, I think if you had asked me uh, perhaps two years ago, I would have thought that actually innovation was, was beginning to plateau slightly. But I think that's not the case now. I think, I, I think the, the rate of innovation is accelerating at quite a rate. And as you pointed out, there's millions or actually billions being invested in this industry. There are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of smart people working on these, these problems. And actually the, 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 the number of new materials, manufacturing processes, manufacturing techniques um, that are being developed and, and announced every day keeps on increasing. I've, I've, I've said to people in the past that when I started um, at Bloomberg, there was a slow trickle of, of battery related news coming into my inbox every day. Um, by the time I, I, I left Bloomberg at the beginning of this year, um, my inbox would be flooded every day with new announcements of companies, you know, launching a new product, whether that was, as I say, a new material or manufacturing process, um, or just finding new and innovative ways to tinker with what's already on the market. So I, th I think we're, we're, we're certainly accelerating at the moment. I want to talk to you about uh, an innovation that I read about uh, yesterday, and I thought it was really clever and, and might hold potential uh, for electric vehicles, and that is combining an ultra or super capacitor with a lithium ion battery pack. And of course, the capacitor provides rapid discharge and rapid, uh, rapid charging, uh, can be, uh, takes load off the battery under, uh, under heavy load like acceleration, and also uh, uh, charges during uh, regenerative braking. So uh, is this one of those, you know, pie in the sky uh, innovations, or is this one maybe got some potential? So I think there's certainly potential there. And it's actually really interesting, because when I started in the battery industry, back in 2010, there was already discussions back then around using supercapacitors alongside batteries to get the most out of electric vehicles. But, but by and large, um, that wasn't something that, that came to fruition. So it's great to hear that that is now um, back in the, the, the sites of some automotive companies. And it, it, it certainly makes a lot of sense because you can use these supercapacitors that can do uh, hundreds of thousands of cycles to absorb this very high power or, or indeed release high power. And that helps with acceleration and regenerative braking. And then you use the battery pack itself as the, the workhorse, the energy that, that gives you the miles. So the, the combination together certainly makes sense. I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the, the, the cost equation. You know, how much does it cost to add the supercapacitors? The, the, the space equation, how much space have you got to play with? And of course, as battery pack energy density has increased, there's more space in the vehicle that can then be put aside for, for things like capacitors. And, and finally, there is some complexity in the power electronics of combining supercapacitors and um, lithium-ion batteries. But again, there have been huge advancements in power electronics that will make that far easier to do now than it was in 2010. Well, let's talk about solid state batteries, because uh, this is very controversial. Uh, we, they have all sorts of advantages around uh, higher energy density, uh, safer, uh, less likely to, uh, to catch fire because they have a solid electrolyte instead of a liquid one. Uh, and Toyota has said they're going to come out with one in 2025. Uh, other comp companies have said maybe late 2020s. Where are we at with solid state? 
so solid state is that yeah as you mentioned there's, there's lots of promise here I, I think of it as a, te as a technology that is is like a um spread that we have for our toast in the uk and the, the logan for this spread is you either you either love it or you hate it and i think solid state batteries are like that as well some people love them some people hate them some people love a specific company and think another company isn't going to go anywhere so it's it, it, it's really interesting um you know i think as you as you kind of mentioned we're still in, in, in the relatively early days of solid state battery technology. We really can't expect what would be classed an, an all solid state battery until closer to the end of this decade, 2028 or, or, or 2030 even. Um, but we might see some iterations along the way. So in, in China, there's certainly already efforts to introduce the, the solid component of the solid state um, battery, which is the solid electrolyte. So introduce these solid electrolytes um, as a separator between the anode and the cathode, but to add some liquid in there to help the, the, the operation of the battery. So you get some of the advantages of, so of solid state, primarily slightly improved safety, but you don't get the full advantages of, let's say, um, perhaps faster charging or um, higher energy density. So we'll see some of these kind of smaller um, incremental improvements in the coming years. But for the companies that people are probably familiar with, like Solid Power, um, QuantumScape, you know, that, that, that's certainly going to be closer to the end of this decade. And, uh, you know, actually having, having said that, the, there are really not that many companies that are, are working on a true solid state battery with no liquids in there. Um, and that's really going to be the kind of pinnacle of, of solid state battery design. And as I say, that'll be closer to 2030. But we're starting to see companies preparing samples for um, automotive OEMs. And, and that's a big step in the right direction because it takes anywhere from you know, up to about four years for an automotive company to qualify um, a, a new battery and a new supplier. So it's, it needs to start today, really, if you want to even be considering um, producing these batteries for, for an, uh, an EV that could be sold in the road by 2027, let's say. Yeah, I, I had the, uh, uh, I interviewed uh, Professor uh, Dirk Uwe Zauer from uh, the University of Aachen uh, in Germany uh, a, a year or so ago. We talked about this and he said, look, if solid state batteries were going to be introduced by, you know, 2025, 2026, he said, we'd already have them in our university on our test benches and we don't. He said, so he was, he was thinking more along the lines that you were talking. And, I, and what that was a little bit of an insight into how much science, how much testing, how much innovation or engineering goes into these new, before they ever get into, a, into an electric vehicle. Yeah, there's a huge amount of, of, of testing at the lab scale. Um, so, so, so the research labs of the companies working on this. And, and they tend to start on, you know, with what are called coin cells. So these are very small button-like cells. And then you have to scale it up from, from a coin cell to, to a small pouch cell. And eventually you've got to get up to a cell that is, is large enough or has enough capacity that would be able to be used in an electric vehicle. And if you think about um, uh, a, a typical EV can have, you know, hundreds to thousands of cells within it. So you then have the challenge of, not just being able to produce, let's say, what one um, you know A4 sized pouch cell, you have to be able to produce not just thousands but hundreds of thousands of these cells, all with very high specifications, uniform um, performance, uniform capacity, um, and you have to be able to perform it, pr produce them at volume and at a low cost, and that's just so that the automotive companies can test them in the real world situations in EVs, in battery packs. Then beyond that, you've got to build a full-scale manufacturing facility that can um, you know, start to produce kind of millions or billions of these, these, these cells. So every step of the way, you have to be very confident in the performance that you're getting and make sure that when you try and make it slightly bigger or at a higher volume, you're not going to run into problems that's going to set you back. Um, and if you, if you are set back, that's going to result in uh, you know higher costs and and you know potentially um, make some of your customers unhappy. Well, let's talk about another innovation: silicon anodes. And I don't know much about this, but I was reading an article that said that this could be a major advance. Anything, any light you can shed on silicon anodes? Yeah, certainly. So I, I've mentioned 
um, earlier energy density and, and, and the need for, or, or not the need for higher energy density, but the, the direction that the industry is going in, in, in improving the energy density of batteries. Traditionally, a lithium ion battery uses graphite as its anode material uh, and it has done for the last 30 years. Really, the anode is the one of the kind of key components in the battery that hasn't changed um, since Sony first invented the or commercialized the battery back in 1991. Um, and silicon anodes are the, the kind of next step in that journey. So while we've seen improvements in the cathode, the silicon anode is, 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 is going to be what um, really the first improvement we, we really see on the anode side of things. And they have a lower volume or a smaller volume than graphite. So that means that the, the volumetric energy density of, of your battery is, is, is increased. And that means more kilowatt hours in a smaller volume. Uh, and on top of that, the um, gravimetric, so the, the weight of silicon um, is lower than um, graphite because you can combine more lithium ions per silicon atom, atom compared to um, lithium ions per, per carbon atom. And so you get this higher volumetric energy density, higher gravimetric energy density, and what that translates to in an electric vehicle is a longer range or getting more kilowatt hours into a smaller volume. So for example, if you're trying to develop a city car, let's say a small compact city car, um, it means you can actually put a, a reasonable size battery pack in there that allows people to live their everyday lives without having to charge every 30, 40, 50 miles or so. Well, fascinating. And um, how soon might we see silicon anodes uh, in production? So it, we're actually getting very close to the point where we see silicon anodes um, being produced at a large scale. I think um, Sila Nanotechnologies was probably the first company to produce a, a high silicon um, anode material for commercial applications. It was going into, it was released in a fitness tracker um, last year and they've now just embarked on um, the scale up of a facility in uh, Washington state in the US and uh, as Sila as, as Nano um, announced that um, uh, facility we also had group 14 announcing that they're building a, a, another facility in the state and there's there's a huge number of companies working on on, on, on silicon who are building full-scale production facilities or, or very close to it. Um, so it's getting to the point it's where I would say it's, it's tantalizingly close. It's still gonna take a little while to get into an electric vehicle because you have to go through that qualification process, but it's not quite as long a qualification process as introducing a solid state battery because it's only one of the components that's being changed. So we could see silicon anodes in kind of 2025 to 2026 um, model years. Now, just to wrap this up, uh, you were talking about uh, energy density and range. And I think in a previous interview, you told me that uh, energy density was rising about 7% per year uh, on average. Um, is that still the case? Uh, and is there variability across different types of batteries and so on? I mean, where are we going with energy density and, uh, and range in electric vehicles? This is a great question. Um, and, and you're right that in the past, we had been increasing at somewhere around 7%, 7 um, uh, on a gravimetric basis each year. We're, we're, we're now at, at a situation where if you look at the average across the industry, actually energy density has fallen. And that's because we've seen more automakers adopting lithium ion phosphate based um, batteries and, and battery packs. And although there have been improvements at the pack level that, that have allowed um, lithium ion phosphate to match the energy density of some lower nickel NMC style cells, you're, you're, you're looking at the kind of energy density of a, a kind of high nickel N NMC pack that was up at, let's say, 180, 190 watt hours per kilogram. That's now dropping to about 140, 150 with LFP. So across the, 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 the industry, the average energy density has, has actually fallen. But if you look at the um, state of the art of high nickel cells, we are seeing that energy density continue to increase. And um, we, we probably will still continue to see that over the, the, the coming years with the introduction of even higher nickel chemistries, uh, as well as things like um, silicon anodes. 
I actually have one more question for you. And, and, and this is, uh, uh, I'm not an electrician or a, a power electronics engineer. So I was curious, I saw uh, the I, Hyundai's Ionic 5 had an 800 volt system in it. And this was, and I didn't understand how they could use that voltage that high and what advantage it conferred. Maybe you could explain that. Yes, yeah, certainly. So, so the key advantage um, with these higher voltage systems is that you can increase charging rates without damaging the batteries. Because if you think about um, how power works, power is voltage times ampage. So to get to a higher power, you can either increase the ampage or you can increase the voltage. And typically what um, car or automakers had done in the past is you're just putting more amps in there at a fixed voltage. Um, but with the 800 volt systems, you can keep the, the, the kind of current the, the same as, as, as you would um, for a slower charging rate, but because you have this higher voltage, actually you're getting more kilowatts into the car and therefore you're increasing your charge rate without damaging the battery because it's the, 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 the current that tends to accelerate degradation within the battery. So the 800 volt system is, is you know, certainly an improvement when it comes to performance VVs, particularly charging. There are some concerns that once you start to get to battery packs that are at that higher voltage, um, you can get what's called arcing. So you can get um, current jumping from the battery pack to the surroundings if it's not protected properly. So that creates, uh, or, or that could create an issue for um, people who are tasked with repairing electric vehicles. So that's something to consider, but it certainly seems to be the, you know, one of the directions that the industry is going in. Well, James, as always, appreciate your insights. Thank you very much for this. My pleasure. Thanks, Markham.